Greetings once again to the good people of uh, St. Luke's Episcopal Church in magnificent downtown Calistoga. And uh, to those of you out in the cyber world, welcome. It's uh, Thursday morning, May 21st, and I'm wondering, as perhaps you are, what happened to May? Who stole May? Wh where did Easter go? Uh, what about what happened to April? What, what about April? Uh, is it Ash Wednesday? I'm, I, I'm Oh. Oh, that's right. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Anyway, welcome, everyone. Uh, here we go again, uh, preaching on Thursday and uh, going to church in pajamas on Zoom on uh, Sunday. But uh, let's begin, as we often do, with prayer. Almighty God, uh, to you, all hearts are open, all desires known. From you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And the collect for the seventh Sunday of Easter. O God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. Do not leave us comfortless, but send us your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to that place where our Savior has gone before, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, in glory everlasting. Amen. And we'll get right to uh, the gospel assigned for the seventh of the Sunday of Easter. You'll remember the context. This is the 17th chapter of John. This is the very end of what's known as the Farewell Discourse, chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17. John has devoted almost a quarter of his gospel to a time frame that might have covered two or three hours in the actual life of Jesus. So as John is putting a magnifying glass on the last conversation that Jesus had with his friends at their final time together, uh, so we too have been putting a magnifying lens on the farewell discourse in these last weeks. But we sum it all up today as Jesus turns heavenward in a prayer known as the High Priestly Prayer. Chapter 17, beginning at the first verse. Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do, and so now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made known your name to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on, the, on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine. I have been glorified in them, and now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one.
One of the questions that's been occurring to me in the midst of this pandemic is, uh, you know, what is the uh, what is the role that prayer has played? You know, let there be no doubt that, um, you know, as we saw this uh, virus making its way uh, toward the shores of the United States, uh, for the most part, it remained something that had not yet uh, hit our shores. No one was quite uh, sure that it would. Some who, who knew what was happening did, but not everyone. But, uh, you know, when it finally began to show up and then to really show up and then to really, really show up, uh, you can only imagine the the amount, the tidal wave of prayer that has gone on, uh, you know, around this virus. And, uh, you know, of course, not just in the United States, but all over the world. And it doesn't matter really if you're a Christian, if you're Islamic, if you're Jewish, if you're a Hindu, a Buddhist, uh, your people, uh, you know, have been praying about all of this. And you wonder, you know, what is the role of prayer? You wonder... Uh, you know, what What role does God take in the affairs of humanity and what influence does prayer have on that interaction? Does God, how does God either manipulate or not uh, the events that transpire on the planet? And as the desperate plea for help has gone out uh, to stop this virus and to heal those that have been infected and suffering from it, uh, you wonder what difference it really makes. And uh, I have to admit that uh, my prayers at the outset were um, from a distance, you know, praying, of course, for those who are suffering, those who are dying, those who are affected, and so forth and so on, praying for the first responders, praying, you know, for those that were being affected. But, uh, you know, the, the, the quality of my prayer changed dramatically when I was in conversation with some very dear friends of mine who live in Florida, and uh, they told me that their son, who I had married and whose children I had baptized, uh, was suffering with coronavirus. And he happens to be a cardiologist and was the recipient of outstanding medical care. He made his way through, but it was one of the toughest battles that he fought. And uh, when news first came to me through them that uh, this individual had contacted the virus, my, my prayers changed. My prayers for him changed for, for his wife, for his children, for his family, for his colleagues. He worked in a, a clinic with, uh, you know, tens of uh, other uh, cardiologists and uh, the patients that he works with. And so that, uh, you know, that changed the nature of my prayer. I remember, you know, in the Zoom coffee hour uh, following uh, worship uh, just a couple of Sundays ago, Elaine Jennings, she and her husband Mike operate a catering uh, business in San Francisco and they do large gatherings. And that entire industry evaporated in a heartbeat uh, when the sheltering began. And who knows when uh, people, groups larger than 50, are going to be able to gather uh, to consume food. And so, uh, you know, they've had to entirely rethink not only their uh, livelihood, but, uh, you know, all of their employees and the people that are touched. And so that, that changed uh, the nature of, of my prayer. And so, you, you know, you have to wonder always, uh, you know, when you pray and when prayer is offered, you know, if you do pray, and I'm sure that you do, you know, what difference that it makes? You know, I've been praying for years for the leaders of the nations to be inspired by the Spirit, spirit to, um, you know, lead the world in a direction of peace. And, you know, I wonder sometimes if I'm uh, wasting my time, I'm sure that you do uh, as well, if you're honest about it. And uh, while prayer is a great mystery, and uh, you know, while the neuroscientists are trying to evaluate scientifically the effectiveness of prayer, uh, it still remains, you know, a mystery uh, quite distant from us. I'm always uh, reminded of uh, John Wimber, who, you know, for years had a very thriving healing ministry in Southern California, and he was asked on many occasions, you know, how come some people get healed and some people don't? And uh, Wimber said, you know, I really have no idea why some people get healed and some people don't. I know that uh, when we pray, sometimes people get uh, healed and sometimes uh, people uh, don't. So that encourages me to uh, keep praying. But the one thing I do know, and the one thing that there is no question about, is that uh, our boy, Jesus of Nazareth, 
the Galilean uh, was a man of prayer. And he prayed on any number of occasions. He prayed fervently, he prayed often, he prayed alone, he prayed with people. Uh, he prayed, and he prayed with uh, great sincerity. And uh, his prayer came out of a great and profound and deep love. And I believe that his prayer uh, changed things and people. And I believe that it changed me. And so uh, we have at the very end of the farewell discourse, Jesus with his friends. And uh, I have asked you in the past weeks to imagine the context. Uh, he has washed their feet. He has fed them with his body and blood. He has uh, announced that one will betray him and another will deny him. And he has told them that he will be leaving soon. And they are bereft. And uh, he concludes his time with them uh, by looking to heaven and praying. And uh, I'm always uh, disconcerted by the geography that's involved uh, with that expression, he looked to heaven because I don't think that's where he looked. I think that he looked within. I think he might have closed his eyes and gone in a more interior direction, but that's just me. And uh, the 17th chapter encapsulates what's known as the high priestly prayer. You know, we call the Lord's Prayer the Our Father, uh, the Lord's Prayer, and uh, really that's the disciples' prayer. They asked him to teach them to pray, and that's the prayer. Uh, that he taught them. I'm not sure that he intended that it be memorized the way that we have memorized it, that, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of people over the years would join hands and offer the Our Father's way of saying the Lord's Prayer. I think it's a model. I think it's a form. I think it's a, a gesture, a, a way of approaching uh, prayer. But uh, actually, the most sincere prayer of Jesus is the high priestly prayer. And in the 17th chapter, uh, Jesus offers it in three specific segments. Number one, uh, he prayed for himself. Number one, he prayed for himself. Glorify your son. He prayed for himself. Uh, what does that mean? It means it's okay to pray for yourself, especially when it comes to your relationship with God and to make yourself available to God. You know, thy will be done. He prayed for himself. He prayed for obedience. He prayed for love. Uh, the second thing that he prayed for with his friends. He prayed for his close friends. He prayed, he prayed for them. He said, uh, you know, you've given them to me and I've shepherded them well. I've taught them everything that you told me to teach them. They're yours. Um, I dealt with them as best that I could. I've loved them. I've lavished myself and poured myself into them. And now I want you to watch over them. Protect them. And he knew how bad it was going to get for them. And then, uh, and then, which was great, you know, he prayed for, he prayed for us. He said, you know, there are people that will never see me, that will never be able to hear me. And, uh, but I'm praying for them, that they will come. They will come to know and believe that uh, you sent me. And, uh, you know, whenever Jesus uses the phrase, uh, believe, and whenever he uses the phrase, no, you know, he's not talking about mental cognition. You know, he's talking about an experience, a, a personal indwelling and encounter. So Jesus prays for himself. He prays for his friends and he prays for us. You know, I'm reminded of how many times in my in my office, I, I, I always had a table and uh you know, it could uh, accommodate a, a group of maybe eight or, you know, a small group like that in my office. But uh, mo most often it was just individuals. You know, people would sit, we'd sit across from each other and they would, you know, hold forth and tell me about what's going on, you know, the, in their marriage, with their work, you know, maybe a diagnosis, you know, who knows. People just come and unburden themselves. And uh it was always my intention in those moments to listen and uh, to pray, to hold whatever they were saying in, in prayer. And then uh, at the end, uh, simply to join hands and uh, to pray. I, I love to pray. 
I love to pray for people. You probably know that about me. I love when people come forward for a birthday or an anniversary or, you know, some transition in life, whatever. You know, I, I especially have enjoyed uh, at, uh, at uh, St. Luke's and uh, the graduates from the program, the rehab program at Duffy's come forward and they'll be, they'll be going out in the world and they're, you know, they're, you know, they've done their work and they're ready, but uh, I want to send them off on the, the wings of our prayers. And uh, so it's always a great blessing and privilege to pray for, for those that are going out. But uh, you know how often in, uh, you know, in joining hands and praying with people, they'll, uh, they'll begin to weep and the spirit will begin to move. And uh, I love to pray. I hope you do too. And, um, you know, it's not always been that way for me. I remember at seminary when my uh, professor or pastoral theologian said, you know, as parish priests, uh, you will be put upon on many occasions to offer uh, instantaneous prayer. You'll be at a potluck supper or you'll be in, at a hospital room or a nursing home or a maternity clinic or wherever. And someone would say, you know, Father, would you pray for us? And um, he said, it's always best to memorize a couple of prayers and have them, you know, immediately available so you can just call upon memory in those instances. And I, I remember uh, thinking to myself, you know, I better get my act together. I'm, I'm not ready uh, for that kind of activity yet. But um, as often happens to clergy, it certainly happens to me. Uh, I had a direct encounter with the Spirit and found out that uh, the Spirit would use me as a vehicle for prayer. And that was a great blessing and a great luxury because I didn't have to worry anymore about what I was going to say. All I had to do is, you know, kind of observe how the Spirit would use me and uh, as the Spirit was ministering the people that I was joining hands with. And uh, that's been a great uh, blessing over the years. Um, and one of the things that I love, again, about St. Luke's is uh, that short walk that I take uh, from the altar rail back to the back of the church often with uh, Robert uh, Finucci uh, to intercede uh, on behalf of people. And uh, they'll come back and lay out whatever it is they want prayer for, and I'll, I'll uh, pray for them and intercede. And it's a great blessing. And uh, I'm not sure what happens when I do that. I'm not sure what God is doing, uh, if anything, when I pray. But I believe that something happens. I believe in it uh, profoundly and powerfully. And I believe that... Uh, when Jesus turned inward uh, to his heavenly Father and prayed that, uh, that he was heard and acknowledged, I believe that when he prayed for his friends, that they knew that he was praying for them and they were strengthened uh, by his prayer. And uh, I believe that when he prayed for us, that we're strengthened uh, by his prayer. And, you know, in the end, what really did Jesus pray for ultimately? He prayed that we may be one. And, you know, it's a very specific uh, kind of oneness. He said, I pray that they may be one as we are one. And I think that the prayer speaks to me in a way that, you know, Jesus wanted for us to have the intimate relationship with the Father, with God, with Spirit, with love uh, that he had. That that was, that was the joy that he came, the abundant life that he came to share with us. And uh, so that's my prayer for you. And uh, this morning, rather than the prayer that I offer, offer so often from my own, I just want to pray uh, from my heart for all of you uh, that are watching this video in the midst of this uh, pandemic. Pray with me. Uh, gracious God, as always, we are so grateful for the gift of life, and we are keenly aware in the midst of this chaos and this virus how precious, how fragile it is, and we're mindful of those uh, who have lost their lives and the families that grieve that loss. We are grateful again for those that have put themselves in harm's way on our behalf, all of those uh, who work alongside uh, those who are suffering from this uh, pandemic. And we pray for those who suffer in any way, financially, uh, socially, and uh, politically, any conceivable way. We've been thrown into a world of hurt and chaos. Uh, but in the midst of that, in the midst of life, you come with your love. And uh, just to remind us that there is a broader horizon, a deeper 
way of looking at life and in the world. And you give us strength uh, to put one foot right in front of the other. So uh, thank you this morning for this offering, uh, for this gospel, and for your prayer. And we need it. And we love you. And we thank you for it. So bless us. In the sweet name of the one who we truly believe you sent. Amen. Contributions to St. Luke's Episcopal Church from patrons like you help to make the digital ministry and other outreach within the community possible. If it is in your heart to make a donation, St. Luke's secure PayPal link, as well as the church's mailing information, may be found in the description of this video. Thank you.